Sabbath by Sabbath, we, we come because of a grace that forgives and a grace that empowers. And praise the Lord for the diversity of gifts, the beauty of music and musicians with Jesus in their heart. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, but we want to love you more. And we love our families, and we want to love them more, better. So now, Lord, I'm praying that we could see how to do that through the principles, the precepts, the stories of your word. Bless us now. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. For a marriage to be beautiful and happy, it has to be real. You have to know what the big things are and the little things are. You have to know what to discuss and what to dismiss. You need a lot of love and patience and forgiveness, and you need a lot of uh, grit and stick to uh, The best gift that I've been given in my adult life is my marriage. It's my wife. I love her more than I love my kids. I love her more than I love anything else. My first love is to Jesus. And my other first love is to her. To kind of get a little bit of how that works, I mean, I, 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 I've had a larger family by today's standards. We've raised four children. And not only that is I've had bigger responsibilities with churches. It's not just their size, it's their busyness, it's their focus. So I can tell you when we went to celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary, we celebrated in year 27. Part of it was timing, part of it was money, part of it was pressures. It wasn't that one of us was neglectful, it's just that's how it worked. I want you to understand how it works. My kids bought my wife a dishwasher two Christmases ago. The problem was I was going to buy her a dishwasher. <laughs> they bought one that was pretty good, but I didn't like a certain feature of it, so I asked them to take it back and give me the money, and I'd buy one a little bit better. That was in 2021. That dishwasher is not installed yet. Oh, mercy, yeah, I heard that. That was a woman, not a man. There's good reasons. I won't go into them all right now. It's close. What I want to do this morning is I want to give everybody some encouragement for making the journey of life. Whether you're married or not married, whether you have been or will be, I want you to think about life's relational laws and maximize them to the glory of God and the benefit of His witness through you and your own joy. So I've entitled this sermon, What is a Marriage? Love Seven Deadly Foes. And, and I'm, I'm going to cover some ground kind of fast, some of it kind of serious. Um, somebody watched last week's sermon and sent me a thoughtful letter. And I'm going to quote you a little bit out of the letter. Made lots and lots of good points. I'm going to start before I read the letter, though, because it's my job to balance things out. If I'm talking to two or three hundred people here this morning and maybe a little bit less at the first service and however many choose to watch online, you've kind of got the broad spectrum of the body, the family, and then you kind of have the outliers. Now, 
my job is to give you enough to work with to where you can pray and talk and deal with what the Lord moved on my heart to give to you to process. How it's received is partially a function of the Holy Spirit. It's partially a function of the Spirit and the presenter. But what I want to say is this, is that last week's sermon, which is what is a family, creation and evolution on display, you have to remember that the main message is going for the main issues. Now, because this letter was written to me, I consider it worthy of making sure I accentuate what was in this letter. If you're in an abusive relationship and you're listening to me this morning, you need to understand that that is not something God countenances. And if there's violence and abuse, there needs to be an intervention. And for any pastors that are listening to me here today, we don't give two verses for their little headache and tell them to go away and stick with, you know, devotion and love and faithfulness and all that. That's not how it works. The way I would relate to anybody that came to me dealing with an issue of abuse is the same way I'd relate to a son-in-law that was abusing my daughter. That was my qualification for becoming your pastor. That's what the Bible said. Pick somebody who knows how to lead their own household well. So I want to make sure that anybody that finds themselves in an abusive relationship, listening to what I'm saying, understands I'm talking down the main. I'm not dealing with the outliers, but I am dealing with a big problem in what I just said. So if you are abusing or you are being abused, there is help. God loves you. It might be a little tough at times, including a little bit of tough love, but there is help. There is provision. And most people that abuse, it's because they were abused themselves. So the cycle can be broken. Jesus is still the healer. Amen? But it does have to be admitted to and it does have to be addressed. So that having been said, I'm going to balance this out. I had a teacher tell me this week that they had somebody that was 10 years of age or younger. So we'd probably say that's primary school ages. Let's make this statement. I've been scarred by my parents' divorce. Now, Jesus recognized that because of the hardness of our heart, there would be divorces sometimes. The point in my sermon last week, as I dealt with Wallenstein's 25-year generational study, is that it's an escalating, ongoing, developing catastrophe. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't moments where there doesn't need to be a divorce. There are some. And abuse is going to be one of them if it's unmitigated. And of course, there's abandonment and there's adultery. Now, having said all that, my great desire is to encourage and exhort you to prioritize your marital love and make this better, not worse. So let's go ahead and try to do that, all right? A few excerpts from the letter I received. I married a man whom I thought was an amazing guy. He seemed to love the Lord and was active in youth groups, seemed to love kids, like the things I liked, enjoyed the things I enjoyed doing. We dated for three years and we were married out of college. I thought I had landed my prince. He asked my dad if I, he could marry me and received his blessing. By the way, this person came from a healthy home. Two weeks after the honeymoon, reali reality set in and his mask came off. The real person emerged and the abuse started. The abuse escalated again. I tried everything I knew, counseling. I read marriage books. I went to marriage intensives. I was determined to make this work. This is a genuine Christian woman who wrote this letter. He would not put the effort into the change. And then there were two sentences that I thought were especially worthy of repetition. She wrote, it takes two to tango, but only one to destroy a marriage. And my friends, that is true. Then she gave this rather unfortunate commentary on the individual. 
And if you happen to be this way, folks, I want you to know something. There's hope for you. But you'll have to admit you're this way. He blamed his childhood. He blamed his work. He blamed his boss. He blamed stress. He blamed his friends. But he never blamed fill in the blank. Thank you. Things were always someone else's fault. Life doesn't work that way. She writes, I did not throw the towel in lightly. I had told myself I was in this for the long haul. Unfortunately, then there's the story of how some of the relationships worked out inside of faith communions. Some have left the faith due to mistreatment and some continue to suffer in silence. While others are shamed into silence with the message that everything will work out, you just need to try harder, pray more, give it to God, and love Him more. You made a vow and you have to keep it. God hates divorce, so you can continue to suffer no matter what. That's not what God's book says, by the way. Amen. He broke me in more ways than one while taking great pleasure in doing so. Now I'm left picking up the pieces of a broken promises and shattered dreams. I was alone in the marriage without a voice. Now I found my voice and I will not be silenced. And that's right. But the last thing I'm going to include from the letter is especially where I want to launch into the rest of the message here. She said, God has provided for me and my children over and over again. I've seen him work mysterious and marvelous ways. And what the locust stole is gradually being restored. My healing journey continues. Amen? Amen. And that's for all of us. This is out of deep pain. Pain that God has assuaged at his healing. So let's just remind ourselves, what is a marriage? I want to tell you that a marriage is a sacred institution. It is designed by God. This week, my wife and I were shopping on our Thursday night shopping date. And while we're in one of the grocery stores, there's an end cap. And on the end cap, it says, I love us. And it's got the rainbow flag. So I probably don't need to describe the rest of it. But I'm going to tell you, it's two men with kids and two women with kids. That is not holy matrimony. That is civil union. There is a huge difference. One will have the potential to grow beautiful fruit and blessed symmetrical children. And the other will not have that ability in spite of everybody's good intentions. Marriage is a gift. It's priceless. The Bible says he who finds a wife or a husband finds a good thing and obtains favor. Marriage is a celebration of deep love and beautiful friendship. It's a journey of bonding and human sexuality. It's also a reflection. Marriage is a reflection of God's love. He made it, and it's, an, it's a communication of his commitment to us. It's also a promise. So barring abuse, abandonment, and infidelity, it's one that ought to be kept. It's a partnership for life, to serve each other and to serve God. Marriage is work. It's helping you become better than you would be without your partner. It's a covenant. And you can't love and honor and cherish while you're abusing someone. And by the way, abuse is cyclical. If you're married to an abuser, they'll abuse you for a while You'll get to the point of breaking out of it. They'll stop. They'll say they're sorry. Then they'll gravitate right back into it. Don't fall for it. It's a cyclical problem. They know when to let up and to let off. Marriage is a privilege. It's a privilege of emotional intimacy and physical intimacy. By the way, in my preparation for last week's sermon, I came across this very interesting question on a creation website. It said, how did sex originate? Now, it's against the backdrop of, of uh, evolution. It says asexual reproduction gives up to twice as much reproductive success or fitness, if you want to use a scientific model, for the same resources as sexual reproduction. So how could the latter ever gain enough advantage to be selected? I mean, if time and chance and circumstance are selecting everything, how could something that's less productive end up being the chosen method for reproduction? And by the way, uh, the commentator goes on to say, and how could mere physics and chemistry invent the complementary apparatuses needed at the same time? Okay, I'm using delicate language here. Non-intelligent processes cannot plan for future coordination of male and female organs. I want you to think about this. How can an undesigned system 
get the right things designed for just the right time. It doesn't work. Marriage is responsibility. It's responsibility to do a lot of things you don't feel like doing. Marriage is much more than a piece of paper, but the paper matters, you know. I could be holding a title to my car here this morning, and it's just a piece of paper. It just happens to be a very important piece of paper. Marriage is a wonderful structure for society. It's because there's an architect, and it can withstand storms. It's a, a union of man and woman with lifelong and eternal ramifications for good. Marriage is also a catalyst. It's a place where you learn things and you grow, which is why pastors bother to preach sermons like the one I'm about to preach. And everything I'm about to say now about the seven deadly foes of love can be applied to any relationship you have in proper measure. It just so happens that marriage is the most intimate, most special, most energy and intensive focus focus dependent one you're ever going to be in if you're ever in one and if you've been in one before and it wasn't all you wanted it to be by God's grace may the future be brighter and better for the young that are listening to me here today I want you to think carefully about what I'm sharing because marriage is supposed to be a foretaste of heaven but it's not always so what are these seven deadly foes of love the first one I've entitled is the failure of preparation. No architect, no engineer, no blueprint, and no superintendent. And somehow we think marriage is magic. Well, I want to tell you, marriage can be magical, but it's not magic. Marriage is because there's been a good preparation. You think about it. When, when uh, Abraham's somewhere in his 120s or so, He's looking for a wife for his promised son who's now getting up there. Actually, I'm thinking he must have been about 140. And he sends Eliezer off. And he's so convinced that God wants to make this thing work that God will answer his prayers. Eliezer's not quite so convinced, but I want you to notice something. Isaac submits to the process of an arranged marriage. Now, to contrast an arranged marriage against a marriage for love is a false dichotomy. Of course, in some places it's not, because in some places, dads are doing arrangements for economic benefit. They're not doing arrangements for love. But in the Bible's version of an arranged marriage, it's always by God's arranging, not the dads, not the moms, and it's for love, it's for blessing. But I want you to see that if you don't make any preparation, you're going to get what you got. It's not magical if it's not been properly prepared for. Some people think marriage is all about tools and techniques. Well, I'm here to tell you something. I could have a snap-on tool dealer drive up to your garage and unload the entire contents of its tools onto the shelves and the workspaces of your garage. But if you've never prepared to be an auto mechanic, it could do you almost no good. Which is why I want you to understand that the main preparation for marriage doesn't even come during the dating and the engagement. The main preparation is mom and dads to give to the child so they have some character and some connection with God. Because it's character at the end of the day that prepares you to be linked deeply with another person. It's the element of who you are when you walk with God. And of course, abuse is a catastrophic failure of character. It's important that you don't exclude your parents and your good friends from giving you feedback. That's part of the preparation cycle. You don't want anybody to comment. You're setting yourself up for what the Bible calls foolishness. The Bible says he who isolates himself rages against all sound wisdom. So you think you got it all figured out and your mom and dad don't know much about you? You think they don't have a sense of whether or not this looks like a compatibility match? Think again. As soon as you cut out I've seen adult people. When I say adult people, I'm talking people old enough to be my parents ignore the advice of their siblings and other people who deeply care and it ends up in disaster. Premarital sexuality will do a number on the foundation of your life. 
We used to ask our children to make abstinence pledges. We need to ask them still. We need to tell them that if you put the physical bonding in front of the emotional bonding, you won't get the emotional bonding. It'll end up like a, a pile of flesh without any bones to hold it up and make it look good. You need to get premarital counseling. And you need to do what Ellen White says, make haste slowly. All right? Slowly. Now, the quote I put in the bulletin this week is not a very positive quote, but I've got it in my notes here, and you can read along if you want, but I think it'd be good for you to look at because, unfortunately, she uses some words that are pretty big on caution. The first sentence is why I chose it. It says, marriage in a majority of cases is the most galling yoke. Wow. A little bit of a downer there, isn't it? Marriage, in a majority of cases, is a most galling yoke. Now, it's my confidence that it's not the case for this subset of Christians that I'm talking to. But for lots of people, and sometimes even people who take the name of Christ, it's not joy. It's a galling journey. There are thousands, this next sentence is a preacher's paradise too. There are thousands that are, are mated, but they're not matched. Our society's big on mating today. One night stand, no problem. Let lust run amok. Mated, but not matched. The books of heaven are burdened with the woes, the wickedness, and the abuse that lies hidden under the marriage mantle. She could say behind the marriage doors. This is why I would warn the young who are of marriageable age to make haste slowly in the choice of a companion. The path of a married life may appear beautiful. It may appear magical and full of happiness. And this last sentence is, was a little bit of a grammarian's twist for me. But why may not your, you be disappointed as thousands of others have been? Think about it. What makes you so special that you can skip the architect, the engineer, the blueprint, and the superintendent, Jesus Christ, and think you're going to get something good? I want to assure you, the ordinary Christian who walks with God is on the track of having a better marriage than the most well-educated in the lines of sociology, psychology, anthropology, and human relationships because there's a counselor who can teach you some things as you go. But if you are too proud to learn from your creator, maker, and redeemer, you're in big trouble. Listen, friends. The first failure is the failure of preparation. And by the way, the ongoing failure is the failure of preparation. You know, if you want to stay glued to somebody, you better go to the glue maker, Jesus, and show him how you can be a part of this great catalyst. The second great foe of love is the failure of intimacy. There's a sacred circle around every marriage. It's so sacred that in the book of Leviticus, it will be stated that the adulterer and the adulteress will be killed if they're found out. It's so sacred that one of the seven commands, ten commandments, number seven, written on stone with the finger of God says, thou shall not commit adultery. It's so serious that in Jesus' only sermon, he tells us to guard our heart and not go around living on the mandates of what the physical eye might, look, might like to look at because the eye and the heart, unconsecrated, can prepare oneself to walk right out of actual intimacy, emotionally and physically. Don't look on another person with lust. Intimacy is hard to achieve. You don't go keep talking to your mother-in-law about your husband after you get married. You start talking to God and your husband. Could I get an amen? amen. You don't go talking about your wife with your buddies. You talk to God and to your wife. Could I get another amen? Okay, intimacy is hard work. Lazy people don't go to hard work. We're back to number one, character, preparation. It's a delicate work, but the Bible says the heart of her husband trusts in her. Failure to leave and failure to cleave. There was some Christian music artist that wrote a song once upon a time, Steve and Annie Chapman. And the name of the song was, The Ships Are Burning. And it was an allusion to what some of these great commandos and generals of war would do. They would take their soldiers and they would unload them on a foreign land and they would burn the ships. The message was, we're not going back. We're only going forward. I can remember one of the elders in the very earliest days of my ministry telling me a, a, a wonderful story. They were 
he was telling me about when they were young, which would, probably would have put them back in about the 1960s, 50s, somewhere in there. And uh, young as a couple, they got into a tiff. They lived in the same town the parents lived into, which, by the way, folks, generally speaking, it's better if you can live a couple hours away from your in-laws when you get married. All right, amen. I got it. There's a little room to forge the relationship and make it without every Sabbath you're eating at mom and dad's house or they're eating at yours. Be a couple, start your own family. But anyway, they lived in the same town and she didn't like what her husband said to her. And I'm assuming that it wasn't way out of bounds, but it was a little first tip. She grabbed her suitcase, filled it up, walked out the door. The man wondered where she was going. She wandered back to the house where she had been raised. She knocked on her door. Her dad came to the door. Her dad said, what do you want? She explained the problem and he said, sorry, you can't spend the night here. You're going to need to go back there. <laughs> All right. That's how it works. Barring the outliers of abuse, of course. The third failure or foe of love is the failure of communication. I call it communication malpractice. And I'm going to tell you this is one of the easiest ones to fix and should be one of the best ones to practice. The mouth of the righteous is as a fountain of life and it is as a tree of life. And in your marriage, nobody should get more compliments than your spouse. So many marriages are dying because they're not watered and they're not fertilized. Just take a second. You would thank somebody else who held the door open for you, so why wouldn't you thank your spouse every single time? You would say please or thank you to a stranger, so why wouldn't you say please or thank you to your wife? This is one of the simplest things that can be done. This failure or malpractice of communication. The Bible says that it's better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Nagging or the constant dripping that doesn't bring the conversation to a head is a poor form of conflict resolution. This is another element of failure of communication or communication malpractice. It's better to go ahead and make some time to put on the table what it is that needs to be discussed. It's better to actually be up front with each other and garner the courage that the one needs and the honesty that the other one needs and in various degrees, both need both of. But you know, a marriage that is well affirmed is one that can handle difficult conflict and a marriage that is neither affirmed or conflicted will gradually grow apart because intimacy requires good communication, affirmation and problem solving. The fourth failure or foe of love is the failure of the compass. I'm not going to look it up. You can check me out on Scripture and see if I'm actually on target. And by the way, the previous one, you've got Michael who despises David for celebrating at the return of the Ark of the Covenant. She despises David in her heart, and I can tell you David didn't have too many terrible different emotions towards her after she made fun of him and mocked him. And then you've got Abigail in 1 Samuel 25 who knows that David is dead wrong but she goes out of her way to make sure she shows him respect while she's clobbering him. Read it. 1 Samuel 25. Every woman should read it and reread it because every man needs a woman who can stand up to her, up to him. But she needs, they need a partner, a wife who knows how to do it like a woman could and should. Failure of the compass. The marriage comes first. Not the job, not the kids, not the ministry, not the mission, nothing. And really, failure of the compass is not even each other comes first, but God comes first because he's the one that keeps my heart calibrated and keeps shaping my character so that I can be honest when I get into conflict and I can be free-flowing with my words of affirmation. I want you to know nobody in the Bible has a marriage more made in heaven than Isaac and Rebecca and nobody in the Bible, I shouldn't say that, few in the Bible probably have one that ends up as disappointing as theirs. It was daddy's favoritism and bonding with the oldest of the twins and mommy's favoritism and bonding with the younger of the twins that ends up to mommy suggesting 
a not so upfront approach to daddy's mistake. And what it does is it drives a wedge in the family where mommy never sees her favorite anymore and they both live to grieve the choices of daddy's favorite. That's how it ended. Somewhere along the line, you know, when Eliezer is on his camel and he's praying, and parents, you ought to be praying for your kids' spouses. He left there being put under oath by Abraham. If you don't find a godly woman over there, uh, you know, in the fam- near my family back in, in Bethel's hometown, then whatever you do, don't let my son marry one of these heathen around here. I'm telling you, it's serious. But Eliezer has learned from his master that God is real, that he's a guide and a provider. And as he's praying on his camel, getting down off her, saying, Lord, may the woman that offers me a drink and that I ask her to give drink to my camels too, may she be the one. He opens his eyes or he looks and there she is. And she doesn't skip a beat. This is a marriage made in heaven. It's an answer to prayer. And I'm sure it had many positive things that aren't shared. But when you read Genesis 27, 1 to 5, you've got a degraded marriage where mommy's tricking daddy and daddy isn't going to like it and the family's going to be pretty poor off after it happens. Overcommitment to the wrong things, overcommitment even to the right things. A failure to continue bonding and prioritizing the marriage. The cares of this life. If there's one thing you need to know, I don't know what the state of marriage is going to be like in heaven. I know it's not exactly the same, but I also know we're going to have families in heaven. I mean, something, something's not completely clarified just yet. But I do want you to know something. God gave us marriage as the best living metaphor or symbol of his commitment to us that there was to give us. And it's supposed to be an amazing journey of joy, just like being in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. So if it's not, taking the next step, maybe there's something in this message that that causes you to think. I had somebody ask me yesterday if anybody has ever done anything different that I know of because of any messages I've preached. I've been standing behind one of these for 32 years. I know some people have responded to the call of the Lord to give their life to Christ. Truth be told, I don't know most of what happens when I'm walking away from this piece of Lexan. But you know, you get to decide. I'm not God. We're all just actors. We're on the stage of the universe, the theater, as it were, of the cosmos. Failure of the wall, number five. You're to leave, and you're to cleave, and there are to be no alien bonds. Inappropriate boundaries are the doom of much beautiful love. The first boundary I want to talk about is lust. Not in person, not vicariously or virtually on the internet, This will eat the heart and soul out of your life, and especially you men. The Bible says it will reduce you to a crust of bread. Now, I don't know anything too much more unappetizing than the idea of finding a piece of bread and all that's left is the crust. Eat your own heart out and soul out. Let the devil feast on your own bondedness by your own choices. Now, if you're stuck there today, I want to tell you something. There's only one thing that's going to get you out. And that's the love of God. Only love can break the bonds of lust. Self-control and self-discipline won't do it. Although you ought to set up a few firewalls, get the software, covenant eyes, whatever it might be, and there's a portion of you that I'm talking to right now for whom this is a problem. It would be almost statistically impossible to put 300 people in an audience like this this morning And not have somebody who's got a hook in their flesh because they've let the desires of the flesh. It could have been started when you were a kid. The devil doesn't want to do anything more than get a child and twist their minds and open up appetites prematurely that shouldn't be opened up. Which is why when the Surgeon General says a week or two ago, your kids shouldn't be on social media until they're 13. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not sure at 13 they're ready. 
especially since the whole system's prowling around for somebody to devour. And what would be a better way to devour them than to open an appetite in their own heart they can't control? That's a natural appetite. That open prematurely can ruin the rest of their lives. Yes, failure of the wall. There are boundaries. Lack of self-control. How about the failure of the three pillars? What are the three pillars? I call them the disaster of the disses. Dishonesty, distrust, and disrespect. Proverbs tells us in chapter 6, verse 16, that there are six things that are an abomination to the Lord. The first two are related, and they will destroy a marriage. A proud look and a lying tongue. If you're proud, you won't even listen to anybody. You can't see, you can't hear, you fight and you reject when somebody who loves you and has no good reason to incur, incur your displeasure gets in your way and says, you are making a mistake. That person has an issue of elemental dishonesty with their own person, with God, and of course they're going to have an element of dishonesty with you. You have to be able to be honest. Meaningful relationships, let alone meaningful marriages, are built on honesty, trust, and respect. You have to be honest about your family of origin. Hey, they weren't perfect. Did you know that? They gave you certain strengths. They gave you some liabilities too. There are some people, especially if you come from an honor culture, for whom any acknowledgement that the family of origin was improper is some form of disloyalty to the family. It's not. Every generation is supposed to keep growing. Your family did their best. You should do your best. Deliver your kids a little higher up on the road to sanctification than your parents delivered you. Don't down your parents for what they did. The Bible says honor them. They did their best. They probably did better than their parents. But if you can't be honest about what your family gave you, you're not going to have the beauty of what God wants to give you in the form of marital love. It's not loyalty to your kids. Especially, this is a problem in a blended home. You take as much time as you need to make sure she's Mrs. Right for you. And you take as much time as you need to make sure he's Mr. Right for you. Because after you come together, you are now the new locus and focus of giving health and functionality to that family. But it's not the stepchildren, your children, his steps or her steps. No, you have to be able to bond with honesty, trust and respect Here's another big deal. <laughs> Rejecting the advice of family and friends in the warm-up to courting. Set me as a seal upon your heart. This is what Song of Solomon says. A lack of transparency is a dynamic of insecurity and distrust. Unwillingness to be vulnerable, that's another dynamic of distrust. A person who is vulnerable and then that trust is broken by telling your best friend or your mom or your dad, that's a breach of trust. So carelessness with vulnerability is a big deal. Gottman, one of the pre preeminent, John Gottman and his wife, preeminent marriage therapist, living and writing today, Gottman says he can tell in a few minutes whether or not your marriage has a future because once contempt enters the marriage, which is a function of disrespect, it's done. But listen to what Paul writes in Titus 2.15. This is for everybody. It's not marital advice, but it sure applies in marriage. It's good for pastors. It's especially good for leaders and parents. These then are the things you should teach. So pay attention. Encourage and rebuke. Nice balance. It's both. Encourage, words of affirmation. Rebuke when you need to. With all authority. It's especially written to preachers. Do not let anyone despise you. This is a leadership principle. It's about respect. 
The NASB will say, disregard you. The Amplified Version will be, conduct yourselves in your teacher's teaching so as to command respect. The International Standard Version will say, do not let anyone look down on you. Listen, it's written to pastors, so it's written to leaders. It's written to people that are married to each other, helping each other to the kingdom. It's written to parents. Conduct yourself in such a way that even if they don't like you, they have to respect you because it's the real deal. You're walking with God. You understand principle and precept. You're not deviating. You're not sweeping things under the rug. You are going to process with Holy Spirit wisdom and prayer dependence. But above all things, don't give away your respect, even if it means you're giving away friendships because someday they may wake up and say, I was wrong and they were right. The mystique of the other person, that's about respect. Don't lose it, ladies. Yes, you are the, the husband is the head, but really most everything you do is together. Lack of accountability. You deal with someone who doesn't want to show you where they've been on the internet. You can't see their texting or their records. They tell you you're just being jealous. I'm telling you they've got a serious problem because they do. If you're married to them, you do too. A critical spirit, this will destroy trust. A lack of willingness to grow. Okay, we're almost to the end. Number seven. You want to destroy love? Then make the mistake that I call the failure of the scale. You know, in our committee room, I've got one of those old-fashioned scales where you put weights on it. I got it as an illustration for a video I wanted to make. I never made the video. Maybe someday I will. But the failure of the scale is the acknowledgement that the little things are the big things. All of that courtesy and kindness and thoughtfulness. The Bible says, catch us the foxes, the little foxes, the spoil the vine. That self-control when you're right, you're just a little irritated by what he said or what he, she said. The truth of the matter is, it's an accumulation of every day's encouragement and every day's word of affirmation, you know, uh, someone, I think someone sent me an article by John Gottman. It had some really good advice in it. One of the things it said was, just say to your spouse daily, do you need anything from me? Are you okay? It's just a little moment to connect. But a marriage of 37 years for Colleen and I, or of 50 or 60 years for some of you, or for three or 30 of some of the rest, is nothing but one day connected to another. And one minute and one hour. And one day and one night. Is a good marriage supposed to fulfill you? Sure it is. But maybe the bigger question is, is a good marriage where I can help fulfill somebody else? My wife, that is. If it doesn't wind you together, it will unwind you. <laughs> I had a young pastor friend of mine text me yesterday afternoon. He said, how would you define love? I gave him a few key words and I said, find somebody who's been married for 50 or 60 years and ask them. They'll be able to give you a good answer. At the end of the day, marriage is an illustration of God's com tremendous commitment. That's why he said, I hate divorce. There's a song written by Stephen Curtis Chapman that is a favorite of mine. And I want to leave you with this thought. It's a wicked world. There's a lot of pitfalls and challenges out there. But this is the essence of marriage. Tomorrow morning, if you wake up and the sun does not appear, I will be here. If in the dark we lose sight of love, hold my hand and have no fear, because I will be here. I'll be here when you feel like being quiet, and when you need to speak your mind, I will listen, and I will be here. When the laughter turns to crying through the winning, losing, and trying, We'll be together because I will be here. Tomorrow morning, if you wake up and the future is unclear, I will be here. And as sure as the seasons are made for change, our lifetimes 
are made for years. So I will be here. I will be here and you can cry on my shoulder. When the mirror tells us we're older, I will hold you. And I'll be here to watch you grow in beauty and tell you all the things you are to me. I will be here. I will be true to the promises I have made to you and to the one who gave you to me. I will be here. And just as sure as the seasons are made for change, our lifetimes are made for years. So I will be here, and we'll be together. I will be here. Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, and Hebrews chapter 13, I believe it is verse 5, says, I will never leave you or forsake you. What Jesus did on the cross was the ultimate sealing of the covenant with his church, the bride, us individually and us collectively. And when we sit down at that marriage supper of the Lamb, the joy of our communion with Christ and the unfettered, unchallenged beauty of our human relationships will be the beginning of an eternity of rejoicing. In the meantime, it's a lot of work. If you're in a bad marriage, stick in there. Aside from abuse, if you hang in there and keep working at it, and trusting and praying, it can get better. And the beauty is, on the other side of some of those heartaches, there's great reason for rejoicing. I shared last week, but I'm just going to share it again. When my dad died on December 28, 2021, after 57 or so years of marriage, I want to tell you, I got the inside look for a number of those years, and I saw the marriage run through some rock-bottom moments. But I want to tell you, he never regretted the call to growth, the call to accountability by my mother, the commitment she had to him. And I want to tell you, I never got tired of eating Thanksgiving dinner with my two parents. I never got tired of eating it with my, with my in-laws. If you're in a difficult situation or the foundation thus far is not ideal, it's okay. Just keep shooting for the ideal, what you got. And let the Lord give you the beauty of what makes the universe tick and what makes life wonderful. It's who you get to go through it with. It's the person you're with. I could be digging ditches with my friends in the cause of Christ and have more joy than people that are out living it up, hooting and hollering with their excess well. The joy of life is partnership. It's connection. It's a little taste of that Trinity dynamic of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And marriage just happens to be the two-stranded cord with God makes it three that cannot be easily broken. All right. Let's go from where we're at. Let's praise the Lord for what he's done. Let's give him permission to lay his healing hand on us wherever we're at. And let's enjoy love because love in the end is the greatest, most beautiful attribute of who God is. It's the essence of who he is. And it's our invitation to live it, enjoy it, and mirror it to the world. Amen.